Thank you, Helen. You know, when uh, uh, we're going to be sporadic in some political insight here for the students in the audience, but the first one you can write down is whenever somebody from the League of Women Voters says something nice about you, that's gold. <laughs> so take it, take it and run. And, uh, and yes, uh, she hit the nail on the head. We have a, a great team put together. They're the ones that make me look good, right? My name is on the door, but um, from our outreach team to our communications team to our legal minds and uh, uh, everybody else, we, we're on a mission. You know, we're on a mission. Uh, I want to start off with a, a couple of things before I really do the, the deep dive into my remarks. First, uh, Rafe, I'm glad this is the Institute for Public Affairs, not Academic Affairs. Because I think a lot of times when we talk about elections and civic engagement, kind of generally, broadly, we, we, we look at it sometimes too academically or, or conceptually. We talk about registration rates and turnout rates, and we just think of numbers, and we don't think of people. And if last Tuesday did anything for people who were cynical about whether it's important to participate in politics, it was the ultimate reminder, the way I feel, the ultimate kick in the gut that at the end of the day, this is about people. You know, the uh, theme of today starts with uh, what the, excuse me, what on earth just happened? <laughs> and where do we go from here? So I'm going to sequence my comments by flipping those two questions. <clears throat> I want to start with the what comes next part. And then I'm going to come back to looking at last Tuesday. And uh, believe it or not, there's obviously some, some tough news and outcomes of it for a lot of us. And uh, I also want to make sure that we, we come away with accepting and embracing some of the good things that happened last Tuesday as well. And, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But first, a little history refresher, since we are on a university campus. Last week, on Tuesday, the United States of America, the voters of our country, elected a president of the United States whose first campaign promise was to build a wall. How symbolic, maybe how ironic, that the day after last Tuesday's election was the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Think about that. When that wall came down, the ultimate symbol of the end of the Cold War. And any student of history, my background's engineering, I'll, I'll apply it here as well, knows that walls are built to divide, not to unite. And while our president-elect may not be familiar with history, he brags about not doing too much reading because he doesn't have to, there's some smart, thoughtful people in this room and throughout the country. Another historical reminder, this isn't the first time that the immigrant community has been scapegoated and has been bashed. Not long after the Civil War, and after the emancip emancipation of slaves for that matter, a series of economic recessions led to a political environment where many, many states enacted laws that made it extremely difficult for blacks to own a business or to vote. In the 1930s and 40s, during the Great Depression, toughest economic time for our nation in history, more than two million people of Mexican descent were rounded up and deported, including many, many who were United States citizens less than 100 years ago. During World War II, Japanese Americans were rounded up and thrown into internment camps, including Manzanar, right here in the state of California, only a couple hours' drive north of Los Angeles. And they lost everything. Everything was taken from them, including their homes, their businesses, and clearly their civil rights. In the 1950s, we uh, saw the Bracero program that brought many laborers from Mexico to work in the fields in the United States to help maintain the agricultural economy. But as soon as World War II came to an end, another wave of deportations 
followed. How is that for a thank you for your work? You know, when I was in high school and when I was an activist in college at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I read about a lot of this stuff. And students, I think you just learned what I learned back then, that this isn't just history we're talking about. We're talking about what does it mean today because it's happening yet again. This is the year 2016. For me, coming out of college was right around the year 1994. And many of you by now have learned of and maybe have studied the 1994 election cycle here in the state of California. Leading into 1994, believe it or not, coming out of a, a, a aerospace uh, sector recession in Southern California, there were Republicans in the California legislature introducing legislation requiring government employees to report to immigration authorities any person that they suspected of being in the country illegally. That was not 100 years ago. That was less than 25 years ago. And that political environment led to a measure on the November 1994 ballot that we knew as Proposition 187, which went further and sought to deny resources and services, not just to immigrants anymore, but to the sons and daughters of immigrants because of the tough economic times that were there. I was 21 years old when Proposition 187 was on the ballot. I was 21, unlike a lot of people in this room, thinking I want nothing to do with politics. Because whenever I heard of politics and politicians, it was, it was not a good news story. Let's just put it that way. And I didn't have a history of growing up being politically involved, like a lot of high school students, college students, and even younger children in California today. I'm the proud son of immigrants. My parents came from Mexico in pursuit of the American dream. They had been here for decades when Proposition 187 was on the ballot, but they hadn't taken the step to become citizens. And so my entire upbringing, we never discussed who was on the ballot, how they were gonna vote, and they never took me to the polls with them in November to go cast a ballot, not because they, they, they didn't want to or didn't think it was important, but they just frankly weren't eligible. But I knew when Proposition 187 was on the ballot, I saw the campaign, saw the measure passed, that I no longer had a choice. Regardless of what you think about politics and, and our, the democratic structure, small d democratic structure in the United States of America, if you are a United States citizen and 18 years or older, you have a responsibility to register and to vote because that is how our political voice is heard in this country. Kind of sounds Pollyannish. For me, the first kick in the gut was 1994 with Proposition 187. For many of the people in this room, last Tuesday may not have been the first, but for many, maybe it was. And this is what's at stake. So when Proposition 187 passed, it wasn't just a threat, it passed, was ultimately thrown out in court. You know, to me, my, my, my life was never the, the same again. I knew that I had to get involved in politics. Initially, I thought, well, whatever I do as a career, I'm gonna make time to volunteer, to be involved in my community, to, to try to defend our rights, try to make life better. Little did I know that I could have a full-time job <laughs> fighting for our rights. And so I started organizing before I knew what organizing was. I met a young man who had also left engineering from the same community I was raised in, who had gone into real estate and was thinking about running for the California State Assembly in 1996. His name is Tony Cardenas. Excuse me, nowadays we call him Congressman Tony Cardenas. And uh, he asked me to help in the campaign, not having studied political science, not having a law degree, not having any of that stuff. I did the only thing I knew how to do. I started calling family and friends. I started knocking on doors. I started calling classmates and you know, people that I played Little League Baseball with or friends of my parents, and we were organizing. We were bringing people together for conversation. We were registering new voters. And when Election Day came around, we were churning out the vote. Tony Cardenas went on to be elected to the assembly that year. He served three terms, was elected three times to the city council in Los Angeles, and is now serving in the United States Congress. 
my career trajectory has been a little bit different from those young activist days. Within five years, I was running for office myself, something I never imagined I'd be doing growing up in the community of Pacoima in the San Fernando Valley. But I did. I felt a calling. I felt a need to try to be a voice for my community. I was 25 years old when I announced my candidacy for the Los Angeles City Council. Was elected just after the age, after, just after I turned 26. Two years later, my colleagues elected me to the first of my three terms as president of the Los Angeles City Council. The youngest member ever to hold that position, the first Latino to hold that position. From there, I went on to serve in the California State Senate. And in 2014, I was elected to serve as the California Secretary of State, the first Latino to hold this position in modern California history. And I, I say that not to brag, I'm just sharing my story, but to all the young people in the audience today that are still maybe coming out of the fog or like my wife and I are still on that emotional roller coaster in the various stages of grief. Any psychologist in the audience? Uh, I can use one right now. Um, you know, it, it's important to recognize that California has been through this before. And look at how far we've come. Proposition 187 was 22 years ago. Here in California, solid blue, liberal, progressive California, 22 years ago. And today, you know, yours truly serves as California Secretary of State. The President Pro Tem of the California State Senate, Kevin De Leon, Latino. The Speaker of the California State Assembly, Anthony Rendon, Latino. We've come a long way. We're now in positions of overseeing elections in a fair way. They're in positions of guiding both legislation and the state budget and determining what reaches the governor's desk and what doesn't. The people who are behind Proposition 187 and, and, and the, the bad intentions behind it, they thought they could bury us in 1994. They did not know that we were seeds. So when I look back and look at the progress that we've made, a couple, another data point that uh, I know Mike Madrid, he left a, a little while ago, but he was a speaker on the last panel before lunch. I know he knows it all too well. Before Proposition 187, 37% of California registered voters were Republican. Today, current voter registration numbers, only 26% of registered voters in California are Republican. The Republican movement and Pete Wilson and all the forces behind Proposition 187, I think they have paid a historical price for that window of time. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But the practical part of what we're doing now, you know, Proposition 187 offers us a valuable lesson because what did we do here in California when Proposition 187 passed? We learned that, hey, we can't just sit back and be attacked. We've got to organize. We've got to keep organizing on a grander scale. A lot of people like my parents, literally hundreds of thousands of people who had been here even as legal residents, just not citizens, finally took the step to become citizens. Many people where they were naturalized or were born here who had never registered to vote even though they were eligible, finally started registering. And people who maybe had been registered to vote for a long time and didn't really vote very often, finally started voting a lot more regularly. So academically, you can say the electorate became more reflective of the people of California. Politically speaking, the politics of California made a permanent shift after Proposition 187. And so we took action to create this change. It didn't just happen because of demographic trends. It takes work, takes organizing, takes vision, takes unity, takes action. And I think that is a recipe for how so many of us respond to last Tuesday, not just here in California, but across the country. Because the, the tone and the tenor of the presidential debate, all the way from the primaries, not just in the general election cycle, is so reminiscent of what I felt during Prop 187 22 years ago. And as I see the demographics shifting across the country, it is so reminiscent of what California has been through in the last 20 years. I just hope 
that whether it's the organizing, the naturalization, the voter registration, and the turning out of voters, that it doesn't take the rest of the country 20 years to get to where we are today, because it can happen in a lot less time. We have shown what happens when we do the work after a big loss like this. But I'm not naive. I know there's a lot of fear out in our community. The stories of kids being bullied in school to taunts of build the wall or, you know, aren't you going to be deported? Kids that are afraid to come out of the classroom for recess because they're not sure if there's, you know, authorities that may be waiting for them or if their parents are going to be there when they get home after school. <clears throat> I can't help but think of my own kids and what could happen to them if, you know, some kid is uh, not getting the right influence or guidance from their parents at home on the schoolyard. So I promise you that I will not sit back and watch threats to our community go unanswered. Whether it's president-elect or after January 20, President Trump, if he fulfills his pledges from the campaign to continue to attack our community, I will fight back. We will fight back. We're already having conversations amongst elected officials of what we can do from a policy basis to protect our communities at the state and at the local level. You heard from the mayor's chief of staff earlier today. We're convening legal resources to make sure that people's constitutional rights are protected regardless of status. And even if we just have to go visit schools and continue to give hugs, we will do what we have to do to make sure that kids, parents, families, entire communities know that California leaders have their back. <clears throat> and, and it's not just about the Latino community. The Asian community is fast growing and has significant percentage of immigrants. They're caught up in this too. And if the incoming administration tries to fulfill their pledge to begin a registry of Muslims for tracking, we'll see them in court. If the new administration wants to go backwards on marriage equality in the United States, we will see them in court. If the new administration wants to divide families or deport entire families, including United States citizens, we will see them in court. And if they want to pursue a strategy of stop and frisk in cities, big and small, throughout the nation under the guise of public safety, we will see them in court. And for the young people here who are working hard to earn their degree, wondering, well, what else can I do besides speaking up? You got to make time. It's not easy. Your course load is heavy. I know I've been there. But you got to make time to volunteer. Find that issue. Find the cause. Find the organization. You got a couple of hours to give because I know you have the passion. I know you got a brain that we can put to work. It's going to take all of us to continue to fight for many, many years. And it's not just about protesting. It's not just about volunteering. And it's not just about tweeting and posting and gramming. It's about voting. It's about voting and making sure that each and every one of your eligible family members and friends are registered and do vote. Because we won't be voting again for a president for another four years, but in two years, we'll be voting again for congressional representatives, for legislative representatives, for a new governor in California. Governor Jerry Brown has been great at advancing a pro-immigrant policy agenda in California. We need to make sure that whoever takes his place is equally committed. And depending on the city that you live in, you may be having municipal elections next year, in less than a year. And we need to make sure that future members of the city council and school boards and mayors are bold and strong, like Mayor Eric Arcetti, in saying, uh-uh, not in Los Angeles. We were going to protect Los Angeles by all the tools that we have at our disposal. So back to the other question of today's gathering. So what happened this election? A couple thoughts I want to share with you. Because again, my career started not knowing much about politics and campaigns or any of that. I just did what I, the only thing I knew how to do, and that's knock on doors, make phone calls, carry that clipboard. And it's so awesome to be in a constitutional office of the state of California, where it kind of just comes back down to that. When I came into office, there was 17.4 million registered voters. 
but I knew there was another 7 million plus eligible but not registered. A lot of work to do to strengthen our democracy. You know, with the year I was elected in November 2014, 42% of the voters turned out that election, a record low. 58% of registered voters did not turn out when I was on the ballot in 2014. I knew we had a lot of work to do, not just because of the numbers. Again, this is public affairs, not academic affairs. What's the people behind this? The people behind the 7 million eligible but unregistered. The people behind the 58% that are occasional once in a while voters, not the every election voters. Who are they? Disproportionately, communities of color. Disproportionately, working class and lower income families. And disproportionately, young people, 18 to 35 year olds, 18 to 25 year olds, disproportionately registered at the lowest rates and voting at the lowest rates. Only 8% of eligible 18 to 25 year olds turned out and voted in November 2014. So I knew that we had a lot of work to do. And uh, when I was campaigning for Secretary of State, you know, I knew that I couldn't knock on every single door in the state of California, like when I ran for city council, and I couldn't call every voter. So I did what I thought was the next best thing for a statewide campaign. I made a promise to visit all 58 counties in the state. And I made good on that promise. It's a big state. <laughs> it's a diverse state. You know, as blue as California is overall, we have some very big and blue counties. You know what? We also have some medium size, some small size, and some very red counties too. But we're all Californians. And they deserve the outreach. They deserve the attention from their representatives too, Democrats and Republicans. Look, I'm a proud Democrat, but I can tell you the Democratic Party isn't perfect in California. At the top, we, we, we pat ourselves in the back because every constitutional officer, the majority is in the legislature. You know, we have a lot of things to, to kind of celebrate, but I can tell you there's pockets of California where even Democrats are hurting for lack of respect and lack of attention. And so it's not just about, oh my gosh, what happened in Wisconsin? Oh my gosh, what happened in Ohio or Pennsylvania or Michigan? We got some work to do here in California too. What else happened last Tuesday? Last Tuesday was the first presidential election conducted without the full protection of the Federal Voting Rights Act, a federal law that stood for 50 years to protect voting rights at its core. Why? Because in 2013, the United States Supreme Court gutted the, the most strongest provision of the Voting Rights Act, the requirement that states and other jurisdictions, including a couple of counties here in California, that had a history, a pattern, or a practice of violating voting rights, before they changed how they do elections or anything related to registration elections, they needed pre-clearance from the United States Department of Justice. They had to go make their case for why certain changes were not going to have the effect, intentional or unintentional, of making it harder for eligible people to vote. For the first time in 50 years, we didn't have that protection. And so what happened? 14 states passed new laws that had the effect of restricting the ability for people to register and to vote. Ohio reduced early voting and made it harder to vote by mail. Can you believe that? Virginia put strict limits on voter registration drives and they enacted a voter ID law. New Hampshire enacted a voter ID law. North Carolina, Georgia, Florida reduced early voting opportunities and they made it harder to conduct voter registration drives. And the biggest example, Wisconsin, they eliminated weekend early voting they used to have er weekend early voting every cycle. They decided for some reason it was no longer a good idea, so they did away with it. And they passed a voter ID law. And we know from data that an estimated 300,000 people who are eligible were told they did not have the proper ID to be able to cast a ballot. And the margin in the presidential contest in Wisconsin was 27,000. Did it make a difference? You decide. But there's clearly a pattern. Many of the states that, that all the pundits looked to to determine who was going to be the next president of the United States under this electoral college format were the very states making significant changes to how one registers and how one votes. 
So I paint this picture not to depress us, but to invigorate us, because both defending and strengthening Voting Rights Act has to be at the top of our agenda, too. And while I may not control Congress, you know, I can at least make sure that in California we're doing anything and everything we can to expand access for voters in the state of California. And so I'm proud to report that we saw great outcomes in California last Tuesday. We have tools for voters like online voter registration. Many of you probably registered to vote at registertovote.ca.gov. That's great. Millions of people use that tool this cycle. We launched online voter lookup tools. We launched an app where you can find your polling place, check your registration status, quick summary of proposition measures. We have adopted and now implementing pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds. We, we passed an automatic voter registration law that goes into effect next year. We have same day registration that's been previously passed and will go into effect starting in January. We have accessible vote by mail for voters with disabilities. We're moving in the direction of having vote centers take the place of polling places, which all that means is imagine being able to vote anywhere in your county, not just that polling place close to where you live, over the course of 10 days, not just one. We're not the only state that has some of these measures, but we are the only state in the nation that has all of these election reforms underway in the state of California. And we saw the results of it already last Tuesday. Record high voter registration, 19.4 million. And the biggest increase from two years ago when I took office, young people. We don't have the final, final numbers on ballots cast, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna break a record when all the, the, the ballots are processed uh, and everything is said and done. Record high number of votes cast in the state of California. We got a good thing going. You know, and it wasn't just the numbers, it's the who participated and the outcomes, I think. Again, being selfish, who, we, who, who Californians voted for, not just at the top, top of the ticket. We elected the first United States Senator uh, since 1992 to represent California. A series of ballot measures, like I'm, I worked for years trying to increase the tobacco tax when I was in the legislature, it was hard. The voters just did it last Tuesday. Right? Jared Brown asked us to extend some current uh, tax increases to keep the budget stabilized. Voters said right on, and we did so. One of the bills I authored when I was in the Senate was to begin to phase out single-use plastic bags. So I wasn't up against big pharma or big tobacco, but I was up against big plastic. <laughs> After eight years of the legislature trying, I got it done. Signed by Governor Brown, what does the industry do? Boom, millions of dollars to collect signatures, forced to issue on the ballot. And last Tuesday, the voters saw right through it and upheld the ban. That's gonna be good for our environment and good for our government budgets. So California prides itself in being a leader, prides itself in being a trendsetter, at times historically not necessarily in a good way, but right now in a great way that we can advance good public policy when we set the stage for it. And setting the stage for it means getting more people to participate because when the electorate better represents the people, the elected officials, and the public policy will follow. I'm not gonna stand here and tell you, believe me, because we're demonstrating it cycle after cycle after cycle here in California. We've come a long way in the last 20 years. Let's show the way for the rest of the nation. And let me end with this. I'm hoping that some of this information I just gave you is motivation for not just to keep protesting, not just to keep talking, but to start organizing and registering and voting. One of our historical figures in California politics, not an elected official, you know him as a farm worker, Cesar Chavez. Yes, we know he said, si se puede, y si se puede. But he said something else too. He says, we do not need perfect political systems we need perfect participation. Think about that as we keep participating, marching, organizing, and voting. Thank you very, very much.